I would like to invite you to open your Bible, if you would please, to Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter. There's a lovely story there that I know you've heard over and over again, and we're gonna revisit it today. Uh, this, this story starts because people were testing Jesus. Uh, they wanted to trap him, to trip him up. He was gaining too much popularity. His theology was different than that of the, the priest and the Pharisees. There were a lot of similarities between Jesus' teachings and the Pharisees. Their practice is really what got in the way. But when it came to the application and to the, the, the elements of grace, Pharisees didn't get that. They didn't like Jesus changing what they had taught. And so they tried to trip him up because they realized that he was, this was something new and different and it was opposed to what they were doing. And so they tried to trip him up. And we find that going on in Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter, starting down here with uh, verse 25. And it says, And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There's actually more to this than what meets the eye. In those days, when, when a teacher was ready to teach, he would sit down. And if you were in the synagogue, everyone would remain standing while the teacher sat down to, to speak. Aren't you glad we don't do that now? Who knows how long I would preach if I was sitting down. You were standing up, it would really be painful for you. So, but we don't do that. We stand up to preach and you sit down. But there, everyone would sit down, including the teacher. He might be on an elevated level, you know, so everyone could see him. And then the students, if you were going to ask a question, you would stand up in order to demonstrate respect for the teacher. This man stood up, but he was not actually showing respect for the teacher. He was, he was feigning that, acting as though he respected the teacher, but he was asking a question designed to trip him up. Now, there's a flaw in the question. Can you spot it? He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do you do to inherit anything? Nothing. You inherit because you're in a relationship. And if you speed up the process of gaining the inheritance, that's called murder, all right? <laughs> and so that's, that's not something we do. No, you, you don't do anything to inherit. You receive an inheritance because you are in relationship with the person who has decided to give you something after their passing, right? And upon Jesus' passing, we have inherited eternal life because we are in relationship with him. So that's the flaw in the question. Jesus sees this, and he knows now automatically why this young man is there. He knows, he knows the law. He knows you don't do anything to inherit. And so he's... He realizes this is something, the, the guy's looking for uh, some word that he can use. So he's going to play the game with him. He's going to play the game with him for a bit. So he's asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus answers his question with a question. And he said, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? What, what does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbors yourself. Now, these two, what he's doing, he's quoting two passages, one in Deuteronomy and the other in Leviticus. There's no hint in ancient writings that these two passages were ever linked together until Jesus did it. When they asked, which is the greatest commandment? He said, the first is the greatest, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And the second is likened to it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is the first one who links those. So this man has heard Jesus' teaching, so th this game of cat and mouth, he's just throwing back to Jesus what he's already heard Jesus say. What must I do to inherit it? How, how, how do you read the law? And then he goes, quotes back what Jesus, so this is a little game they've got going on here. They both know it. They're jousting. And he's linking together two Old Testament passages never linked before until he heard Jesus do it in his teaching as he's explaining the greatest commandment, right? Love for God, love for your fellow man. So he's doing this now. He's playing the game with Jesus. And so Jesus, um, he doesn't want to go there. Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. And by the way, to say do this and you shall live, love God perfectly, love your fellow man perfectly, you might as well tell him jump flat-footed over that 10-foot wall. You can't do that. Because what is required for heaven is perfect love. I've not been perfectly loving 10 minutes in my life. In fact, let's, let's back it off to five minutes. I'm not, let's back it off to one minute. <laughs> because even when I'm loving and I do a good thing, very often, I'm sorry, but I'm human. It's, it's for mixed reasons. Even if I'm not aware of it, there are mixed motives there because I'm about as sinful. I'm probably at least as sinful, maybe more so than you are. 
That's who I am, and that's who I am by nature. And you can't be perfectly loving. You can't work that up. You can't do that. Only God is perfectly loving. So he's telling, he's telling him to do an impossibility. Do something impossible. Then you'll inherit eternal life. That's, not what, that's what you want to do. Do this. And so, of course, you can't do it. So the lawyer, though, isn't catching that part of the argument. And so he thinks, all right, love God, love my neighbor. All right, let's identify some terms. If, if we can narrow this down, maybe I can make this doable, right? Verse, uh, the next verse, verse 29, but wishing to justify himself. By the way, can you justify yourself? <laughs> There's only one who justifies you. That is Jesus Christ, the righteous. Your good works, your good effort, we're not going to do that. But Christ justifies you when he forgives you. Wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? All right, let's, let's narrow this down, and I'll figure out who I have to be nice to, and then maybe I can do that and, and love, love God. I got that. I know how to, basically, to the Jewish mind, their, their creed was love God by keeping the Torah. That's, that's what they thought. Uh, love God by keeping the Torah. Jesus' thought was love God by loving others and following Jesus. That's his, his creed. If he had a creed, it was love God by, by, love, by following Jesus and loving your, your fellow man. That's how you do it. But the Torah, it was, uh, by, for the Jew, it was love God by keeping the Torah. Now, this loving other people, though, that's a hard thing, so how do I do that? Uh, let's narrow it down. Who do I have to love? And in his mind, there were, there were three basic things that this could be. The first that he hoped for was, I, my neighbor are other Jews who keep the Torah as I keep the Torah. That's my neighbor. And that's easier to love. You know, they're not all wonderful, but that we have enough in common, I can do that. I can love those individuals. Now, there's a, a broader application of that, and that would be, all right, not just the Jews who keep the Torah, but all Jews. I, and that's harder because some of these Jews are really not very lovable, but I, all right, maybe that. The third application he thought that Jesus could come up with would be even more odious to him. That would be the, those who keep the Torah, all Jews, plus any stranger within your gate, because the Old Testament said that you shall treat the stranger within your gate as though they are your brother. Treat them with dignity. That, that's a harder one because we got these Roman soldiers here. And we don't like them. I'd, I'd like for them all to die painful deaths, you know, and so that we are now free. That's what he wanted. So he didn't want that. He didn't realize that Jesus was going to go broader than that. He had thought it was no possibility. So let's, let's identify the terms. Jesus then answers. Uh, Jesus replied and said, and then he goes into, in verse 30, a parable. Now here's what we have to understand about the parables. The parables were not sermon illustrations. They're not just good stories. Jesus was a Jewish theologian, and Jewish theologians shared their theology by parables. Now, Western theologians, they will tell you, if they're going to share their theology, here's my theological premise. They will state it in a sentence or two, then they will give the supporting evidence, and as they give the supporting evidence, they will talk about word studies and context and the broader application of these things, and they will continue to mount this evidence until they come back around and restate their premise, I've proven my point. That makes sense, right? That's a logical, didactic means that the Western mind follows in order to prove a point. Jewish theologians would have none of that. They wouldn't recognize that if it happened. They would think, what's wrong with you? You've lost your mind. A Jewish theologian says, you want to hear my theology? They tell a story. They tell a parable. The parable was the theology. As you analyzed and wrestled with the parable, you would get the theology. This is my theological premise. If you want to know the theology of Jesus, study the parables. These are not just nice little stories. This is deep. This is the thought of God himself. You want to know what Jesus taught, understand the parables because that is his theological statement. So he's now telling this, this young lawyer, we've played cat and mouse. You've asked me a question now. And even the, the second question you've asked, who is my neighbor, is, has a fallacy to it. Jesus isn't going to answer that question. He's going to answer the question the man should have asked. And we'll find that out as we go along. He will not answer that question, but he said, you've got questions. Here's my answer. Here's a theological premise I'm going to share with you. I'm going to lay some theology on you. And when he starts telling the parable, everyone recognizes this is theology. So here he goes. 
Jesus uh, replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, this man, we're not identified. He, the, the parable does not identify the man as Jew or non-Jew, Gentile or anything else. So the assumption is that this is a Jew. If, if it were something other than a Jew, then he would identify it as something other than a Jew. This, this is a Samaritan, or this is um, a, a Roman, or somebody of that nature. He doesn't. This is a man. Now, he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem was the high point of the country, not, not just topographically. There were other places. Higher. This, this was the, the high point emotionally, theologically, philosophically, as well as a high point within the country. Everything, all roads led up to Jerusalem, or they went down from Jerusalem. You didn't go down to Jerusalem even if you're on a higher peak. We're going up to Jerusalem all, because Ju Jerusalem is the pinnacle. This man is in Jerusalem, and he's going down to Jericho. Now, the road between Jerusalem and Jericho in those days, and even as late as the 1940s, 1950s, was known to be a place for thieves and robbers. If you're going to get mugged or waylaid, that was the place it would happen because it was a craggy place with a lot of places for, for thieves to hide and a winding road, and they would waylay you there. It was known. It was also known that if you were stopped by bandits and you gave them what they wanted, they would not hurt you. But if you resisted, they would either kill you or leave you wishing you were dead. This man made the mistake of trying to hold on to his possessions. He made the state mistake of resisting, and when that happened, they beat the daylights out of him, left him half dead, four dead. They took, to add insult to injury, they stripped him, and he was laying naked, almost dead, by the side of the road. He resisted and almost paid for it with his life and would have had someone not come by to help. So this was something that they all understood. Yeah, Jerusalem to Jericho, dangerous place, dangerous way to go, usually travel in groups for safety, and this man resisted, and now look at him, look at him. Uh, verse 31, and by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, priest, most of them, this was a, an inherited office because it was by family. This was a, a segment of the, the tribe of Levi, and this was passed on from generation to generation within families. This was a wealthy class of people. They were known to be among the wealthiest, and most of them lived in Jericho. And you didn't serve as a priest in the temple except for a, maybe once a year, maybe twice. You'd go up for two weeks. When you went up to, to Jerusalem from Jericho for your two weeks, and that would be allotted to you by lot, you would take with you two people, and this was an honor for them to serve with you during your two weeks in the temple. The first person you would take would be another Levite, not a priest, but a, a, a part of the, the tribe of Levi because it was their job to care for the temple. The priest was a secular, with a separate family who did the priestly work, and then you had the, the rest of the tribe who were trained in various aspects of caring for the temple. So this was an honor to be chosen by the priest to go up and assist him as he served in the temple for two weeks. You would also take a layman, someone not necessarily in the tribe of Levi, who would go with you. And again, it would be, they were doing the grunt work, the, the, you know, the, the dirty work, and while the priest served the priestly function. But it was still an honor to do this, so you would take those two people with you. The priest was wealthy, and the priest, being wealthy, you would never find a priest walking up the, the, the road uh, some 17 miles or better to, from Jericho to Jerusalem, or walking back. He wasn't going to do that. He can afford an animal. He's going to ride. The priest is going to ride because they were wealthy. He would not walk. He's not going to waste that kind of time. He's going to ride. And so this priest was riding, having probably spent his two weeks in Jerusalem serving the temple. This is a spiritual high for him. And he's coming back. And on the way back, he sees this man by the side of the road. Now, he's got a dilemma because the law states that if this man is a Jew, he must help him regardless. He must help him. But he doesn't know if this man's a Jew. You would recognize whether or not he's a Jew by whether or not he's circumcised, and that requires a bit of close examination that he was not interested in doing. Um, and we would probably require that he touch him in order to examine, so this is not something he wants to do, right? Um, 
Also, you would uh, identify a Jew by, whether or not, by how they were dressed. Well, he's not wearing anything. His accent, he's unconscious, he's not speaking. How would he know whether this is a Jew or not? So that's a one dilemma. He's required to help him. If he's not a Jew, he's not required to help him. If he touches the man and the man dies, then the priest is declared to be unclean, and he cannot serve again as a priest until he goes back to Jerusalem and arranges for a costly week-long purification ceremony that he's got to endure. He's already spent two weeks up there. He's over two weeks because with travel time out of his schedule, he doesn't want to go back and now and spend the money to organize this, this costly purification ceremony, spend yet another week in Jerusalem. And the, you understand? This is, this is inconvenient for the man. And if he touches the man and he's already dead, then again, he's got to go through the purification ceremony. He doesn't want to do that. He doesn't know who this guy is, if he's dead or alive. So he makes the assumption that this man is either already dead, so he can't touch him, or that he's not a Jew in the first place. And he goes by on the other side. That's what's going through this man's mind. So he's had to make a decision. Is this man a Jew? Is he alive? Is he dead? He's made his choice and he's gone by on the other side. Verse 32, likewise a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, again, in the listener's mind, they're assuming, all right, this guy spent two weeks doing his priestly duty. He's going back home. The Levite may not be as wealthy as the priest who invited him to come along, so he's walking. Uh, he doesn't have the animal, so he's behind the, the priest who's got, gotten a head start on him with the animal. He's going much faster, right? When he comes up now, the Levite's got a dilemma. My priest has already gone ahead of me. He's already gone by on, on this man and is judged that he's either not a Jew or already dead. And if I touch him, I have to go through the purification process because I want to serve in the temple, and I can't afford that. But if I touch him... And, I, and he's a Jew, and I save his life, I've just upped, I've just won up to my priest. I've kind of insulted him because I didn't trust his judgment. I've got to face him tonight when I get back home. I'd like to serve in the temple again sometime if he takes me. You understand what's going through now, this man's mind? He's looking, I don't, I don't want to shame my priest who's already made a decision about this man. Why would I question his decision? I don't want to make, 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 put myself in bad standing with him. So he said, I'm going to trust the opinion of the priest with whom I have served, and I'm going to go by on the other side too, so I don't have to have the purification ceremony. And if, I'm, you know, if the priest is wrong and I save this man, I don't want to face the guy because I've now just shown him up. I don't want to do that. Now, if you're, if you're listening to this story, you assume that the next person is going to come by as the layman that went with the priest up there to, to do the priestly duty, right? You, it's, you, you tell a, a story about, about the church. You got the conference president, you got the pastor, and you got the head elder. Well, first came this conference. That would be a good joke, right? You go in that, that kind of order. That's what they're expecting. But that's not what they get. Jesus now throws a curveball at them. Uh, they're expecting a, a fastball over the plate, and they get a curve out of the strike zone. And they don't know what to do with it. Because not only does he throw this third character in there, but he throws someone in they detest. They despise. If you're a good Jew walking down the street, you see a Samaritan coming your way and he's casting a shadow, you will go way out of your way so his shadow does not fall on you. You don't want to walk through Samaria because you hate those people. They fought battles for the last 450 years. They despise one another. At one point, the Jews went to Samaria and burned the temple on Mount Gerizim. Well, in retaliation a few years later, they, they didn't have the military might to fight and to burn Jerusalem, but what they did is they gathered the bones of dead people, and the night before Passover, they, they snuck into the temple, and they spread the bones throughout the temple, thus making it unclean so the Jews couldn't celebrate Passover that year because they had to purify the temple. It's just meanness, but they were happy to do it because they hated each other. If you, wanted, if you were a Jew and you wanted to really insult a man, you call him a Samaritan. I am not. Those are fighting words. They, they hated each other. And Jesus now introduces this character into the story. And be, beyond that, he makes him the hero. That's like telling a story in the Old West about a cowboy and an Indian and making the Indian the hero and the cowboy the villain. You know, you don't, you, those are fighting words. You're going to find yourself on the wrong end of a six-shooter if you do that. And, 
in the deep south in the days of slavery. It'd be telling a joke about a white man and a black man and making the black man the hero. That's how prejudiced they were. Jesus cared nothing for their prejudices and wanted to confront them. And so he throws this character in there who they despised. They would say that a Samaritan, the reason God made Samaritans is so that he would have fuel for the fires of hell. That, that's how much they hated these people. And Jesus takes this person hated by them but loved by God and used this man as the hero of the story. So we come now to the third person in the story. Verse 33, but a Samaritan, curveball, they don't get it. Oh, where did this come from? Who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. In fact, the word used for compassion is he's about to cry. This is a deep he's, sense of emotion as he feels his guttural response to this man. Oh, my word, no. Here you are naked. But you're about to die. I, I've got to help you. There was a genuine emotional response to the sight of this man. Not knowing if he was Jew or Samaritan, he assumed that he was a Jew. He's in Jewish territory, right? That's what you have to assume. He would know that this is a man who would walk on the other side of the road just to stay away from his own shadow. He knew that. He knew the prejudice. And still he felt that kind of compassion for this man. He saw beyond the prejudice. He saw a human being. And so he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds. By the way, if you were on a journey, you always carried bandages. You carried wine because of the alcohol content, then you would pour it on an open wound in order to help clean it. You would also carry oil for soothing purposes. And you might even mix the two together and apply them at, at the same time, the oil and the wine, in order to, to heal and soothe at the same time. Pouring, uh, pouring um, oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own beast. So this is a wealthy man. He's a wealthy Samaritan on business. He's got a beast. He put him on his own beast and brought him to the inn and took care of him. By the way, archaeologically, when they do the digs, they have never once found an inn that was not located inside a city or a village, which means that this man carried a half-dead Jew into Jericho. You think about that. You think about in the, in the, in the South, a black man finding a half-dead white man, taking care of him, bringing him into town. Who do you think the white people are going to figure did this? You know it. You, that prejudice runs strong. That means that this man is putting his life at risk. He's not just slowing down his own journey. He's not just going out of his way. He's not just spending the money for the hotel. He's not just spending his, his, his wine and his oil and his bandage on this man. He's risking his life to redeem him. Who has done that? Jesus did that. The Samaritan is the Christ figure in this story. He represents God. He represents God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Can, can you see the genius of Jesus in telling this story this way? Oh, I love him. Oh, he, he challenges every ugly thing we do. Our social ugliness, our, our, our selfishness, our pride, our lust, he challenges it. He takes our values and turns them upside down. He does that with our gender preferences. He does it with everything across the board. He, scripture says he sees not black or white. He doesn't see, see male or female, Jew or Gentile. He sees people. And he blesses and redeems and uses you according to his will. And took care of him. It says, on, on the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. Why did he do this? Because he knew that if the man took longer than that to heal, and if the, the, the money he left was not enough, by law, the innkeeper could sell the man into slavery in order to recoup his losses. Why save the man's life only to have him end up as a slave? He has no money to pay. The man was naked. There was no hidden purse. He's got nothing. So why would you save his life 
only to have him end up in slavery. He's not going to do that. So he redeems him to the uttermost. He saves his life. He promotes his healing, and he pays for his freedom, for his liberty. Who else has done this? Jesus. This man is the Christ figure, the hated Samaritan, the Christ figure. Now Jesus asked the question. He's told the story. People are slack-jawed because they hate Samaritans. And you're making this guy do something good? Are you kidding me? And now Jesus asked the question that is the clincher. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? There's more on that question than what you think. First of all, realize he's not answering the question, now who is my neighbor? Let's limit this. He's saying, forget who your neighbor is. You need to be a neighbor. You need to choose to be a neighbor, and and the person you choose to be a neighbor to is anyone in need, period. Age, race, creed, matters not. Even if they live a sinful lifestyle, you're not the judge. They got a need. You can meet it. You meet it because that's what it means for you. He says, here's the call, not for you to decide, well, who will I allow to be my neighbor? (laughs) Here's the challenge. You be the neighbor. You're asking the wrong question. You be the neighbor. So, who, um, which one of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robbers? And he said, the one who showed mercy to him. He couldn't even say the word Samaritan. Uh, the one who showed mercy. Whatever. Can you, can you imagine this? He couldn't even allow the word to fall off his lips in a positive way. Then Jesus, and now get this, I love this part of it. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. All right, you go and be like a Samaritan. (laughs) Oh, I love it. There's an irony there. There's an in-your-face element to the story. And yet, there's a real challenge. He said, you're playing games with me, son. You're trying to trip me up, and no, you don't do anything to inherit And no, you can't be loving of God and loving of man because it's not within you to do it. But here's where you start. You choose to be a neighbor to anyone who needs you. That's the story. That's the story. You see, when Jesus comes in, he changes you. He doesn't just, he doesn't change the surface. He doesn't change your title or your position from sinner to Christian, he changes you inside out. And the changes, sometimes we think about the changes as being external. Well, now I no longer do this and I no longer do that. That's, that's the least of his concerns. By this they shall know that you are my children and that you have love one for another. That's what, you want to know what the prophets railed against? Very little of it was about Sabbath breaking. Almost all of it was their treatment of the poor, the disenfranchised, the widowed, the orphan, the stranger in their gates. A failure to show love. He said, why do you treat each other this way? God says, love me and demonstrate it by following Jesus and loving each other. Everyone. Everyone. I pastored a church for a lot of years. Loved this church. I pastored there 17 years. And we, we were having four church services a, uh, a day in order to get everybody through. Our auditorium sat, uh, seated 600, and we had to have four church services every, every, every Sabbath. And so that meant that there were a lot of people coming through, and I couldn't greet them. I couldn't get to all of them, obviously. There are too many people for me to do that every week. But I noticed that there was a woman who came, and I, I knew the woman more by reputation. I, I had met her, and I'd met the man that she worked with. He w- the man she worked with was a psychologist, a former minister who now had a private practice, and she was a woman who also had a, 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 a doctorate, and she had private practice in counseling with this the psychologist. So I knew her from that, and I knew they were kind of on the fringe. They were not really Adventists. They were and I was pretty sure they were Christian. My, my young people refer to it, they were Adventish. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Adventish. <laughs> kind of like that, actually, but that's... So uh, I, I knew that, but she, she looked very angry. She, she had this look on her face, anger. But she would be there every week taking notes, and I couldn't get to her to talk to her. There were too many people, right? And she wanted to get out quickly anyway. Every week. Her name was Peggy. And then I got a phone call. After a number of weeks of this, Peggy called me up and asked for an appointment. So I was happy to do that. She came into my office and she started to cry. And she said, I started attending your church after I ended the affair that I was having. And she named the individual with whom she was having the affair and it was the partner, the former minister who is now a psychologist. She said, we've been having an affair for 35 years. All 35 years of those, she kept promising he would leave his wife, but never did. There was always a reason why he couldn't. And finally, she said, I had enough. 35 years. Well, she's a patient woman. <laughs> That's a patient woman. In that, in that case, patience was not a virtue. <laughs> but she waited 35. Finally, after 35 years, she said, enough. I'm sick of this. And she ended it. But during those 35 years, her children had seen that she had ended her marriage for no cause. And so they had kind of separated themselves. Her grandchildren, she had very little contact with. This was a woman alone who had wasted her life over a man who was not deserving of her love. She had wasted it. And now she's just broken. How could God even love me? And that was her question. How could God love me? And I opened the Bible with her and I shared with her the passages of God's redeeming love, of how eager he is to forgive regardless of your sin, how eager he is if you confess, first of all, it says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It doesn't say if you confess your sins unless it's been really bad and you did it for 35 years. It doesn't say that. You confess, he forgives, period, done. Also, he says, when you confess your sins and he forgives you, he says, I will bury your sins at the depths of the ocean. That's, there's one place where we know the ocean is seven miles deep. That's seven miles of salt water covering your sin, and God posts a sign that says, no fishing allowed. He says, I'll remove your sin as far from you as the east is from the west. He didn't say north from the south for a very specific reason. If you start traveling due north, and eventually, where do you get? North Pole, right? You go to the North Pole. Which way do you travel from the North Pole? South. All directions are south of the North Pole. You, if you're going to move, you're going to go south. Doesn't matter which way you move, it's south. You go south. North meets south. But if you start traveling due east, you can travel east throughout all eternity. And you'll never go west. East never meets west. And you will never meet your sin again. And the best part is, he says, I will remember your sin no more. You confess it. He, he buries it in the sea of forgetfulness. He doesn't remember. In fact, if tonight you confess a sin to him, tomorrow you feel guilty about it, you confess the same sin, you know what he says to you? Child, I'd love to help you, but I haven't got a clue in the universe what you're talking about. I don't remember that sin. He can't remember it. When I shared that with her, that the first time she'd asked for forgiveness, it was gone. She just, it, it was too good to be true. I just kept pounding it home with passages showing how good God is. And eventually she got it. And she received him as her savior. And she kept coming to church and kept taking notes. She started coming to prayer meeting. I anointed her. I believe in anointing. This is a biblical practice shared with us in James chapter 5. I've anointed for everything from chronic diseases to, to uh, terminal diseases to broken relationships. I believe in it. I anointed her twice for the broken relationship with her family. And we put together a plan how she might reclaim them. And she kept praying. And finally, she called me one day. She said, one of my granddaughters called and asked me to lunch. I had two clients scheduled. I, I canceled them both. I'm going. She went to the lunch. She came back she, elated. A small door was open, and eventually the door got wider and wider, and she was restored to her family. God was blessing her. The anger was dissipating. There was no more anger. And then the man with whom she had the affair died. And his wife, going through his personal effects, found a stack of letters, not to Peggy, but to other women all over the world with whom he was doing the same thing. Now that woman came to see me. You talk about one angry woman. She was angry. 
It's a good thing he was dead because otherwise he was going to be dead. <laughs> and so I had to help her through that as she learned to forgive him so that she didn't live with that kind of resentment on her heart because that would kill her. And then Peggy came and she said, I know she now knows about the affairs, but she doesn't know about me. What should I do? I said, what do you think the Holy Spirit's telling you to do? She said, the Holy Spirit's telling me to confess it. I said, I'm not going to argue with him. Is that what you need to do? Then let's do it. We put together a plan. And she confessed it to this woman. And the amazing thing is, the woman forgave her. Not only did she forgive her, but they became best friends. And they would sit together during worship and take notes. And when Peggy died, guess who was by her graveside? Guess who came? Guess who stood by her? But her new best friend. Jesus says, I want you to follow me. And more important than the Sabbath or your understanding of prophecy or your health message or anything else are these two issues. Love God and love each other. Here's how you love God. You love God by following me and loving others. Don't ask who's my neighbor. Find somebody in help and need and be the neighbor by helping them. That's his message to you today.